As you see in our worship bulletin, the scripture reading for this morning I've taken from the book of Psalms, Psalm 137, verses 1 through 4, and I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Okay, now the context is this. The setting, the background for our scripture reading is this. It was about 600 years before Jesus lived, okay? About 600 years. I'm going to show you on my map the places that we're going to be talking about. And this is a map that I carry with me everywhere I go every day. And that's a map that I make with my hands. This is Israel, okay? Over there is Babylon. That's the capital city of Babylonia, which is our modern-day Iraq. Now, when we heard in the scripture, by the rivers of Babylon, those would be the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Remember, this is Israel. Over there is Babylonia. In our brief time together this morning, we're going to land on just one story, just one particular scene in an incredibly rich drama. The Holy Land right here had long since divided into two sections. There was the northern kingdom that kept the name Israel and the southern kingdom that took the name Judah, sometimes Judea. The Jewish people as a whole, north and south, had rebelled against God. Not once continuously. They turned their backs on God and more and more began to look and act like the pagan, godless, heathen nations that surrounded them. They resisted God's call for them to return. They refused to hear and obey God's calls of love. God sent many prophets throughout the land and throughout the years, pleading with the people, pleading, Turn back to the Lord. But any positive response, any, any bit of revival, that was all short-lived. And so the Bible tells us that God permitted enemy nations to rise up, to attack, and pretty much destroy the land. And there's so much more to this, friends. We have to have a Bible study or something sometime to get into this. I apologize for what I'm just being so narrow in my focus, necessarily so. The great and powerful nation of Babylonia rose up, attacked, and destroyed the southern kingdom of Judah. Their capital city, which was Jerusalem, also called Zion, the capital city of Jerusalem was burned, their temple destroyed, the holy temple, which represented to them the very presence of God in their midst. The temple was burned and demolished. Now, in three major military campaigns, we could think of them as deportations also. The, the people um, of Judah, this southern section, especially the elite, the healthy, the wealthy, the well-educated, the gifted people, those who would be useful to Babylonia, they were carried off to the great city of Babylon, which was their capital city. When they were carried off into exile, this is what is called throughout all history as the Babylonian captivity. Believers from the southern part of the Holy Land known as Judah, taken in exile, over to Babylon, 800 miles across the Arabian desert. 
the Babylonian captivity. Now we do know, well first of all let me say that the Jews were allowed to live together in communities over there. They were allowed to farm and perform other sorts of labor to earn their income. The Jews were treated okay. They weren't slaves, to be sure. They were not slaves, but they weren't home. And even though it was their own rebellion that brought the judgment of God upon them, as the prophets continually warned the people, their words falling on mostly deafened ears, the people were certainly discouraged and disheartened. They were dejected and devastated. They felt they were cut off from all they had known. Severest of all, they felt cut off from God for remember, the beloved temple was no longer. Now, I want to tell you that this story does have a happy ending, and it's beyond our scope for today. But I have to tell you that God was still with them, and God made God's presence known to them while they were there, even in exile. God still had a plan, still had hope for them. After 70 years of the Babylonian captivity, a new world power raised up, and that would be the Persians. The Persians then dominated. They were the power to be in the world, and they had a king named Cyrus. And if you know anybody named Cyrus like I do, tell them what a great name that is and what a great king King Cyrus was. For he then was the king of the ruling power, and he made a decree that the Jewish people could come back home. After 70 years in the Babylonian captivity, Cyrus said, you can come back home. Well, that's the happy ending of this, but we don't really want to spend time there because we want to stay over in the exile. Let's stay in the Babylonian captivity because that's when and where this psalm was composed. Psalm 137. Can't you hear the pain in their words? The intense grief, the sense of loss, the crisis of being in exile. They found themselves in a foreign land and there was nothing to do but weep. They hung up their harps on the willow trees, and singing was out of the question. They couldn't sing, not in their present location, not in a foreign land, far away from the place they knew as home, far away from their place of worship. And to make it all worse seems to be their captor's sarcasm. Sing us one of the songs of Zion, one of the songs of Jerusalem. Sing. The New International Version says, There our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. And this was another way of their taunting. Ha! Where's your God now? And so they wept. And so they expressed their grief and their pain. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Well, friends, you and I are sort of in a foreign land right now, too, aren't we? Throughout this time of renovation, as I said, we're going to be worshiping here at the Mont Union Chapel, DeWald Chapel, with a couple weeks at Copeland Oaks, one week out at Silver Park, July 13th, that is, with our Alliance 8. These are foreign places for us to worship, indeed. They're nice enough, in fact, beautiful, as is the chapel at Copeland Oaks and certainly Silver Park. We're talking beautiful, comfortable enough, but not home. Not home. And some of us may find ourselves asking, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? How can we still be church in this strange place, this strange land? It's not the same. It looks different. The sound is different. Nothing is really familiar to us. The parking and everything else is more difficult. I can say I do have a transport wheelchair at home. I will bring that next week. If anyone needs this, it will be here. How can we sing in a strange and foreign place? Well, to be perfectly honestly, friends, it's easy, isn't it? 
It's wonderfully easy. For the God we worship, the one and only true God, has assured us, Genesis 28, verse 15, know that I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go, for I will not leave you. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, I will be with you, God promised. Exodus 33, 14, my presence will go with you. Deuteronomy 31, 6, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And in Matthew 18, verse 20, like we already heard today, Jesus promised, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus said, I am there among them. Wherever. And in Matthew 28, verse 20, among the last words Jesus spoke on this earth, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so we will gather and worship together throughout the summer in different places, in perhaps strange and unfamiliar surroundings, and yet assured of his presence, encouraged by his comfort, and filled with his hope and his peace and his love. Thanks be to God that we are the church in a foreign land. Thanks be to God.